in Jesus' name. Father Lord, we thank you once again. We exalt your name as an opportunity this evening to honor you and to exalt you in all the earth. There is none that can deliver out of your hands. When you walk, none can hinder it. Oh Lord, my God, we use this opportunity to glorify your name and to exalt your holy name. Because in all the earth, you are the God who delivers. You are the God who can save and protect. You are the I am that I am. You are the teacher of your world. Oh Lord, my God, we call upon you tonight as we use this opportunity to honor you in the midst of the church. Because you said if your people that are called by your name shall humble themselves and pray that you, the Lord God of hosts, will hear from heaven. You will answer our prayer and you will heal our love. Oh Lord God of hosts, tonight is a wonderful night. A night of blue joy, a night of wonders, a night where the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. Father Lord, the hour has come. Glorify your name. Prove yourself strong in the midst of the church. Lord, tonight we use opportunity to look into your world, to celebrate with the rest of the world the resurrection morning of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, today was the day that Christianity was born. Father Lord, because if Christ has not raised from death, our hope is vain. Our Christianity has no basis. The only reason we can attest to the fact that we are Christian is because Jesus rose from the dead. Today, I join with the rest of the saints in the world to celebrate the resurrection morning and to give glory to the risen Lord and to celebrate Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we ask for your guidance today as we open the mystery of your final return. Lord, with the guide of your Holy Spirit, with the understanding of your knowledge, teach us, O Lord. Make known to us the manifold word of the God that is written in the scriptures, that we may be able to understand this mystery and explain it to your church. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, this morning, good this evening, my name is Missionary Collins. I'll be your host for this evening. Today's teaching is on our understanding prophecy. And the topic is the Lord's return. The Lord Jesus Christ has promised us he will return. But this time is not returning for a show. It's returning to preach to a church and to save the lost. That's why he is returning. He promised us he will return. That when he goes up to his father, he will come again. And when he returns, he will take us to where he is. So that where he is, there will his servants be also. Brethren, this morning we use this opportunity to tell you the Lord Jesus promise of, of his return to take the saints back to heaven. And that's why tonight, as we join together to celebrate the Lord's return, and we say this, Father, may the graceness of your resurrection remain with us until you return in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, we exalt the name of God this morning, and we thank him for the wonderful book he gave us in the book of Revelation, where he used opportunity to explain to us that he is not just the Jesus we see go to heaven, but he also will return. But when he returns this time, how many of us will be happy to have our master and Lord return to the earth? Last week, we established the fact that he is not returning as a lamb that was slain 2,000 years ago, ago that rose up on this resurrection morning. 
which we celebrate today. But he is returning as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Israel call it Mashid Nagid, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That is the God that is returning. He is returning in fury. He is returning in wrath. He is returning to avenge his blood upon those who neglected his death. Who think it not worthy and think themselves not worthy to accept the salvation he gives. That is the purpose he is returning. He is returning to take possession of the earth. To dispossess the kings of the earth. And those who join the league with the Antichrist to disturb the earth and destroy it. And God is coming to give vengeance to the power of nature. Because even nature themselves go on in travail till now, waiting for the adoption of the sun to wait. Because they are also tired of the burden of decay and which the sin of man has brought upon the inhabitant of the earth and nature itself. That is the purpose of today's teaching. That while you celebrate, you have a mind to understand that this Jesus you see ascend to heaven. In like manner, he will come again. And this time he is not coming like a lamb to show pity upon the inhabitant of Israel. But this time he is coming as a judge to judge the living and the dead. If we understand from the scripture that Lazarus who was dead for four days could be raised up from the grave, we knew revelation is not a mystery. That if he could raise Lazarus from the dead and he could raise himself up from the dead, therefore he is able to wake us up who were dead. So some people said, how will the dead be raised? What manner of body would it have? When Lazarus was raised from the dead, a man that was dead for four days, and by that point he was beginning to stink, what body did he have? He was able to sit with Jesus as dinner, we know that, from the scripture. He was able to embrace his sisters and brothers. His grave crop was physically wrapped up and he was loosed and he sat with Jesus that day. But now let's talk about the final resurrection. Remember one thing about a piece of corn. When you take a piece of corn, you throw it into the earth, it stays alone. Until it's dead, it cannot bear fruit. The only way a grain of corn can bear fruit is when it's dead. And when it's dead, what happens follow dead is decay. It returns to dust because everything on the earth was raised from it. And once they return to dust, it's forgotten. But a new life springs up from the grain of corn that was dead and rotten. This take a new body. A body was not the same body that you saw that get up. The Lord gave it a new body. And that body will bear fruit. Some a hundred corn, some a thousand. Depends on the nutrients that the soil supplies. The same happened to you. We were sold in shame. But will be raised in glory. We were sold in corruption, but will be raised incorruptible. It is not the body that is sold that will arise, just like you learned from the illustration of the grain of corn. The body you sold will be different from the body that the Lord raised up. The Lord is going to raise us all incorruptible. Is going to prepare us a holy church, sanctified and purified for the master's use. The church which he himself will take pleasure in, 
That is the church God is talking about. He's not talking about any church on top of the surface of the earth. The church that will lose their favor. No, that is not the church. The church Jesus Christ is coming to raise is the church that was bred in purity. The church that was bred in honor. And the church that was bred in glory. That is the church is coming for. A glorious church. He has risen from the dead. Showing us an example that it is possible for the dead to be raised. If the dead can be raised, which Jesus has showed us an example of. That means, he, the Lord Jesus, is able to raise us up from the dead. If he can raise us up from the dead, how therefore you say the dead cannot be raised? If the dead cannot be raised, our Christianity has no basis. The only basis for our Christian life is because we knew that the dead can be raised incorruptible. So, if the dead can be raised, that means we have the hope of resurrection. Knowing that God will raise Jesus from the dead, the same God will raise us up incorruptible on the last day. And with the same manner at which Jesus was raised, we also shall be raised. And this resurrection is the assurance we have as believers that indeed the dead did rise from the dead. That Christ has promised us resurrection and is indeed possible for every believer. Let's return to our topic of today. Why is today's teaching very important for us to know? Especially on this resurrection morning. Why the rest of the world celebrate and glorify God on this gracious resurrection morning. Where all the saints are in great glory and expectation. Glorifying God for raising Jesus off from the dead. Some celebrate in ignorance. Some celebrate in knowledge. It doesn't matter how they celebrate. But the most important thing is that we celebrate the risen Christ. And that is my message for today. And the fact that we celebrate the risen Christ means with God all things are possible. And we are glad and witnesses of his majesty. And we testify that God raised up his son Jesus Christ. But if we say the dead is not risen, we have found false witness to Christ himself. Because that means we are testifying that Christ raised Jesus which he did not raise. But the fact that the dead are raised incorruptible make Christians have something to celebrate. Today, I tell you the truth. The reason why we celebrate is not misplaced as believers. Today is a day that the Lord has made. A day we should rejoice. A day we should be glad. A day we should celebrate with the rest of the millions of saints around the world. A day we should give glory to the one and the only true God. Who indeed raised Jesus and made him a perpetration for sin for our sake. He was crucified. And the enemy rejoiced over him. But he rose. The enemy sought to cover his resurrection. Even to today, the same enemy tried to cover the resurrection. One of the key airmark of the Antichrist is that he was wounded to the death, but his deadly wound was healed. His deadly wound was healed. Why would the Antichrist want to symbolize? The resurrection of Christ Jesus. 
because he knew resurrection is the central of Christian faith. No Christian can be converted or be brought to glory without the resurrection. So, if we can testify that God raised Jesus from the dead, we have a clear conscience towards God. And that is our greatest joy as believers. When we understand that if He raised Jesus from the dead, indeed, that same God, He is faithful. He can raise us up from the dead. And if God can raise us up from the dead, we have nothing to fear. That means death cannot have the last laugh. Neither can he have the joy of us. As we celebrate with the rest of the saints, we are glad to testify to the inhabitants of the earth that the God who raised Jesus is still on the throne of power and is ready to raise up the quick and the dead and to prepare us a kingdom that has foundation that the builder and maker of such kingdom is God himself that is the God tonight we are celebrating and that is the reason why we celebrate today for most of us it is a thing of joy that we should be counted worthy to be presented as children of God in this midst of a crook and preserved generation. So, we just need to glorify the Lord this day and to exalt him in the congregation of the saints. Brethren, today's teaching is quite simple, the Lord's return. Our text is taken from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, I will read from verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Of such, the second death has no power. The second death has no power over him. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Last week we did specify this, but we did not have the time to explain to you who are these people. Who are these people that take part in the first resurrection, on whom the second death has no power? On whom the God of this world has no power. These are those who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And like the wise virgin, keep extra oil in their lap. And hold on to the promises of God that set free until his final return. And indeed, he returned. When he returned, it was not in shame, but in glory. He returns to bring the saints to a glorious resurrection where all saints celebrate him. The Bible said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive in his train and he gave gifts to men. Today, we're going to be studying the Word of God under some few topics. Our text will be taken from Revelation chapter 20 from verse 6 to 15 and Revelation 21. The future return of Christ in glory. When it is understood that we will set up his kingdom and judge his enemies and reward the faithful and the living and the dead. That is the clear mission of Christ's return for the second time. He is not returning again to the cross. He is not returning as a lamb or 
to rule over the king of kingdom of Israel alone is returning to rule over the entire human race. And in addition, judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. That is the purpose of his return. But the question to ask, who will endure the days of his coming? The Bible told us in the book of Habakkuk that he is like a fuller soul and he will purify the sons of Jesse. And he says, the rod is in his hand. And he, the Lord, is like a fuller soul, meant to purify. And he will refine the children of God, of Israel, until they submit themselves with a perfect offering unto God in holiness and purity. That is his mandate. Then, now we understand the purpose of his return. With the Lord return, what is the second coming of Jesus Christ like? The second coming is when Jesus returned to judge all mankind. But why is this judgment necessary? The judgment of mankind was stated from the beginning when man rebelled against God. Because the Bible told us that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. God gave us a gift in the beginning, which many of us may have overlooked. The gift of life. Man was raised from the dust, from craze of the earth, and the Lord breaks into his nursery. And the Bible says man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. And that breath has kept us till today. Despite the sins in the world, despite all the things that are hard to speak about, the bread has remained. The Lord has never grown angry at a point in history to withdraw this bread that He gave us as a gift from creation till now. In fact, that gift is what keeps us alive. That gift makes us great. It makes us worse about. And God gave us knowledge and authority to rule over the world. To have dominion over the beds of the air. Over the fish in the sea. Over the force of the feed. And over all creeping things that creeps upon the earth. But there was one unique dominion that was not included in that dominion. A set over our kind, man. The enemy, the animals, some walk on four footed beasts, some on two. God gave us dominion over them. But he deliberately did not give man dominion over another man. Because he wanted men to be equal, he wanted men to rule their world, to control their society. To replenish the earth and to subdue it. That was the authority man has from God. But when they wake up one morning, the serpent deceived them, telling them that they can be like God. What God are you going to be like again? You were made in the image of God after his likeness. You have dominion as God has dominion. Over all created things. What other authority were you seeking for? What knowledge do you need that you do not have to be able to formulate names in your brain and the name come in total resemblance to any situation? And that is the name that situation creates. What knowledge was man actually seeking for that he did not have? I will tell you the knowledge of evil. Man needed to understand the knowledge to do evil. Not only did they want to name other animals. Since man fall till today, man has did several wonderful things. But one of the most wonderful things they did 
was to rule over another man. Not to rule over the animals and the beasts which God gave them dominion over. Not to control the world and to subdue it which God gave them dominion over. But they want that authority to be on the reverse. Rule over God creation. But God did not want man to be ruled over by another man. He wanted men to have fellowship with him. He wanted men to come to, the, to him every evening. They can discuss the plan for a new heaven, a plan for a new earth, a plan for the galaxies, how to transport the stars, how to go beyond the boundary of the earth. The Bible says God spread the heaven, not for himself. He spread it as a tent for man to dwell in. The heaven was spread. God has his inhabitation before the heaven was ever created. But God spread the heaven, which we today we call space, so that men would live in it. The earth was not only for man to live in. Today we are trying to regulate the population of the world because we don't want people to be too much on earth, hoping it will not affect nature. God told us to subdue the earth, rule beyond the earth, go to other galaxies and take possession of it. Such wisdom and knowledge was given to man. Man, in his infinite wisdom, has discovered that despite his sinful state, that his dominions and strengths are more than just to stay, contained in one small log on earth. But they were supposed to rule over the universe and the stars in the galaxies. But man sought one unique attribute from the devil. They want the knowledge of evil. So for every good thing man creates, man creates 200 evil. And evil never depreciates. But rather, it appreciates. Sin never declines. Rather, he increases. Because when the devil is given one foot and he succeeds in taking away your slippers, believe you me, the next day is coming for your shirt. And two weeks later, it's coming for your life. And that was exactly what happened. Man gave a foothold to the devil in his dominion. By giving the devil his God-given authority, the wet of riches that God gave to man, man deliberately handed it over to the devil. And since that day to today, the devil has sought for the life of man. Not only does he want to control and rule over them, but to have total dominion over their soul. To answer to him whenever he chooses. To decree a thing in their life, and it will come to pass. To sit upon the mountain of congregation, to be like God to them. But he was not trying to be like the Almighty God. But we knew the kind of God he wanted to be. A terrorist God. A God that ruled with vengeance over the people. That is the God he wanted to be. God was meek and gentle. He believed in cooperation. He believed in the power of unity. That's why when he wanted to make man, he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let this man we are going to make, let's have dominion. A greedy man can never give you dominion over his property. That show you God might be, name might be jealousy, but he is not a greedy God. Because if he was greedy, he would not have given man any dominion over his creation. But because he was not a greedy God, he gave you dominion over the work of his hand. The thing he made, the same way he made man. Mass and the beast were formed from dust. But yet he gave man dominion over his fellow beast. And over all the best of the earth, over all creeping things, over the vegetables and the flowers, he gave us dominion. Even the things we use for herbs and the green leaves of the forest, he gave us dominion over them. Today in chemistry and botanics, 
People study herbs and use them as medicine for the word of God and to heal the sick and if possible to take care of infection that was disastrous to men. That is because God gave them dominion and wisdom to study it. Why is these things mandatory and important to us? God said something specific here. He gave us this dominion so that we can be manifold children unto him. We must show his praise in this world. Even when man fell, God sought for a man after his heart. He found first Enoch. Enoch was perfect in his heart. The Bible said he was not sin. You know why? God took him. That's why the sin of man. God took Enoch. He took Enoch because why? He was found perfect before the eyes of God. And until tomorrow, God is still looking for people who are perfect in the earth. And the moment he finds such perfection, he is going to take them out of the world. Because God loves obedience. That's why he told King Saul, when he told him, I brought all the goats and the sheep to sacrifice to your God in Shiloh. God said, had the Lord any delight in sacrifice? Or burnt offering? Than to obey his word? All God wanted from man is obedience. God wants us to obey his word. To obey to God is better than any sacrifice we can ever make. It doesn't matter what prayer we go to church on this Easter morning to pray. It doesn't matter what sermon we listen to. It doesn't matter what ordinances and how much million we give to the poor. God values obedience more than them all. To obey to God is far better than the sacrifice of a ram. To hacker than the fatness of a lamb. God viewed disobedience as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity itself. And today, God is just telling you exactly the same thing. But in this history of man, man has always looked for a way to mess up. God gave man rights to every tree in the garden. A the tree of the knowledge of evil. And that was for their good. Because the day they had the knowledge of evil, death come with evil. That is the day they died. God warned them for their own good and their own benefit to stay away from the fruit of knowledge of evil. But man, being man, went in search for the fruit of knowledge of evil. And he did eat it. The woman ate it and gave it to her husband. And the, woman, the man ate it. And their both eyes, according to the word, was open to evil. And that was why they saw their nakedness for the first time. Because the knowledge of evil has been initiated. Because it was not before they had no knowledge of their states. They were like children. They easily forgive. They don't know how to guide iniquity in their heart. And such were the children of God. It's not that offenses doesn't come. Offenses will surely come. But blessed is the man that is not offended. That was how God expected man to be like. But the knowledge of evil made them to understand how lustful the things of the eyes were. How depreciating the other man looked. How weak in strength he can control his neighbor. Then all this evil became their new research. Since that day till now, man has involved what we call a research of emptiness. We search for what we cannot find. We have been seeking for knowledge. More knowledge in this 21st century has been gathered more than since the foundation of the world in this 20th century. Yet we do not close, get close to the knowledge man has 
or need to have in order to assess the presence of God. All our knowledge, the more we seek for knowledge, the more we get emptiness. And the more we get emptiness, the more we seek for more emptiness. Oh, there are always new things to find. And the more we find new things, the more we discover that those things are useless. And we seek for new ones. The more we try to invent what is good, from one good, 200 evil emerge. That is the knowledge of evil. When we want to discover drugs, we bring in virus. When we want to discover protection for ourselves, we bring in bombs and grenades. When we want to discover space rockets, we bring in rocket launcher and a supersonic missile. All these things came from a knowledge of evil, which man deliberately added to himself. It was not part of man's creation. Today, people blame God for the death and the wickedness on earth. God did not bring them about. Sorry to say, we brought it upon ourselves. When we decided on our own to disobey God, we brought death and destruction upon ourselves. But with God being rich in mercy, full of compassion, He loved us so much. The love of God was eminent in Genesis. At the call in Genesis chapter 3, at the call of the evening, God came to have fellowship with man. You don't have fellowship with somebody that is not your friend. You have fellowship with people that are close to you. Your inner cycle. God left heaven. He left his throne. He left his angels and the bounds of heavenly trumpets to come to earth to have companionship and discussion with man. He was their father. To tell them bedtime story. To tell them how far they have gone and how they should go well. He cared for them as a man cared for his own soul. Until man rebelled. So that was the kind of fellowship man has. When man fell from grace, God has sought for a way to cover man up. But how will he cover a people that are not willing to be covered? God finds himself in an unfamiliar territory because man did not fall into sin out of deception. They knew the truth and they willingly disobeyed. God's judgment is upon willful disobedience. That's why we don't baptize children. Because children does not have ability to will sin for themselves or to willingly disobey God. So because of that, Christians don't baptize children. We baptize adults, people that have come to the age of accountability. They can take responsibility for their crime and their sin. Those are people we baptize. Because such person knew what is wrong before he does it. And that was the same way man was. Man was not created as a child. Man was old enough to get married. Man come to the age of accountability. He know the difference between right and wrong before he indulged in them. And that particular act, God discovered that man was naked. And that nakedness was not just physical nakedness, spiritual nakedness. Remember the demons had just been cast down. And so are all their hosts. So are hosts of other demons that were in earth before man was ever created. And now they discover mass nakedness. They will take advantage of it. God decided to clot us. But how did he clot us? Remember we tried to clot ourselves with the garment of religion. When we built apron for ourselves. Today we have a lot of people in the world with different garments of religion trying to cover themselves, separate themselves from the other people, preserve themselves as if they were holy with the same garment of religion. Religious abides in many things. A belief system that you have confidence in, that you cannot do without, is a religion. But men try. This is the most holy way. There are some that want to protect the climate with their life. It's a form of religion. There are some that believe in one name or the other. 
is another form of religion. But God does not believe religion was a cover. He decided to do something unique. That was unique to only him. Not man. Not the angels. Not the host of heaven. But was unique to God and God himself alone. And what was this unique ability of God? It was clear. God decided to clot man with an innocent lamb that was not there when Adam or Eve committed sin. This lamb was slain from the foundation of the world and it was used as a clotting garment for man. God symbolizing to Adam is by sharing an innocent blood that the sin they just willfully committed can be atoned for. It cannot be atoned by the blood of a goat, ram, sheep, or the blood of a bullock, but by the blood of one innocent man. And this man must be a man that have a testimony that he lives. Because the state at which Adam and Eve were when they sinned, they never died. They were children of Jehovah. Their day did not start counting until they left the garden. So to bring them back to the same garden, God made a man who is like after the order of Melchizedek, who has no beginning of days, no ending of days. And it must be a free will sacrifice. Not a first sacrifice. And that's why God sent Jesus 2,000 years ago that he may take the shame of mankind on the wooden cross on Calvary tree and where he was sacrificed for the world. He the just for us the unjust that he may make us a holy priesthood a chosen generation, a peculiar people, who should show forth the praise of God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous life. But now, he has set a day of judgment, a day that he is coming to judge the quick and the dead, where the dead will hear his voice. Death is not an escape route. There are a lot of people who sort of face their error and repent from their sin. They prefer to take the easy way out, commit suicide. Suicide is not a way out because you will all wake up and face the shame you are running from. Face the humility you are running from. Face the affliction you are trying to cover up. He that covereth his sin will not prosper. Oh, some say, I don't want people to talk about it. Because I don't want my sin to hurt me. If you are hurt by people simply measuring your sin, how hot will it be when you stand between the judge where the whole human race are there, including your father, your people, the people you are hiding from, their eyes will see your sin. And they will see your abomination on the last day. Will you be able to hide them? Brethren, if you cover it, your sin, you will not prosper. The only way is to forsake them. And confess openly. Repent of it, you will obtain mercy. Covering your sin is not a way out, it's a way in. It's a shortcut to hell. You cannot be saved except you willfully repent. The Bible says, Let the wicked forsake his evil way, and your righteous man his thoughts. And return to the Lord our God, for him we abundantly pardon. How wicked are people? The Lord is saying to you today, there is a way out of your sin, but this way is simple. Forsake your evil way, and you, this unrighteous man, forget all your evil thoughts. Return to God. And you will have mercy. And the Lord said clearly in his word, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And have compassion on whom I will have compassion on. 
And it just clearly makes us understand that He, the Lord, he is the only God who can have compassion on any man he so chooses. But today, are you willing to be part of those mercy? Because God has promised us compassion and mercy for those who we are setting and not consider themselves a God in the earth. Or consider themselves too honorable. The Bible says that God has proposed in his heart to execute judgment upon all the unrighteousness of men and to bring into contempt all the ungodliness that men has ungodly committed. Brethren, are you ready today to accept Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who for the grace that was said before him, he endured the cross, despite the shame. Let's look upon Jesus, that man who endured such contradiction for himself. Let us not faint or be crushed when we are brought to trial. Because the God we serve is no mock concerning his promise. Because what a man sow, that is what he will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will the spirit reap eternal life. God is saying to you today that all things work together for good. For those that love God and to those who are the call according to his purpose. God is just warning you. He wants you to understand that it takes only faith for the just to live. But how does the just live today? By faith. Christians should understand that the grace of God was revealed from heaven. In the same way that his grace was revealed, the wrath of God will also be revealed from heaven against all the unrighteousness and the wickedness of men. And of all the sin that the ungodly sinner has ungodly committed. The second coming is when Jesus returned to judge all mankind, the living and the dead. The living including all those who has lived. And when he returned, the dead include everyone else. And all who have lived and died physically. Jesus said that everyone who has died will raise from the dead and be the judge. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and that's why we celebrate today Easter, you should know he's able to raise you up from the dead, even if you have been dead for many years ago, and to face the music. He made us understand in the book of Matthew in the story of Lazarus that the dead in hell he paid. Not to talk of the one that are raised to the flesh. So you will feel the torment. Aha. Uh -huh. Somebody says the wicked commit sin and no man questions their orders. And these people go on punished from years to years, from generation to generation. What about them? The Lord said, wait patiently to the end. Throughout the book of Revelation that we study, there is no judgment that the people say doesn't match the crime. The same way, the judgment of the Lord and the Lord will match every crime. And he is, his first coming or call when he became a human being, lived as a perfect child and died on a woody cross for our sin. Then he rose from the dead and ascended up into heaven before the eyes of all his disciples. And about 550 people who were alive in poor time saw him ascend. He did not ascend in the speed of light. He ascended slowly. Every eye saw him. When he shall return the second time, 
he will not return in a hurry. The Bible says, as the sun comes from the east and shine as far as the west, so shall his coming be. Every eyes will see him. Even the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And the king of nations will will because of him. The dead will rise up. The sea will bring up the dead that died in them. Fire will raise up the dead that died in them. The ground will vomit up everybody that he buried in it. Even the breeze will bring forth those that met it away in the air. The Lord will judge all. So there is no escape route. Taking the ah, if I finish committing this sin, I can't just kill myself and present, prevent myself from persecution. Human judgment can escape you as long as you are dead. But spiritual judgment will not escape you even in death. So that's why. If we know that God is going to judge his people, what manner of man ought we to be? We knew now that God will bring all things into judgment, whether good or bad. And whatever we have done with our body, whether it is be good or evil, the Lord will bring all things into judgment. And the Bible says every man will give account of himself, of the life he has lived with his or her own body. So your body is not your own. I know many people shout, my body, my pride. Your body is not your own. Your body belongs to another. Somebody moved it. We don't know how long, but we know he took him time. And to the extent he did not do it alone. He did it with the whole host of angels. So if you waste that work, you will be judged for it. If you waste your life, you will give account for it. If you waste your brain that God has given you, you will give account of it. If you waste your knowledge, you will give account of it. If you waste your beauty, you will give account of it. God is not going to say, this man was so evil, I'm not going to judge him. He's going to judge all, including the demons, including those who led you into sin. We understand something from God's judgment in Genesis. Not even the devil escaped his judgment. He turned into serpent. Serpent received the brunt of judgment. How? He lost both of his legs and his hand. He was to eat dust all the days of his life. Until he returned to dust. Because he was cursed above all the animals and the fig. Out of all the beasts of the feet, serpent is the only one that has no leg. No leg, no hand. Because why? He was to eat dust because he deceived man. Today, women still find it difficult when they want to give birth. In pain, they prefer because of the cost that was placed upon women. Because the soul was multiplied. What about man? Today, man still suffer to eat. And labor hard all his life to eat tongues and tissues. That is because man was caused to labor. So this judgment, if they still apply to us to tomorrow, what makes you feel about his judgment? That tells you many Adam has died many, many years ago. His children have died many, many years ago. But his cause still apply to us. Both the Christians are not believers. Until Christ take it away on the last day. What makes you feel you can escape God's judgment? God's judgment is not once. Oh, if you throw me to the fire, I burn. That is the end. No. If you believe that that God's judgment did not come to an end, so will your judgment not come to an end. Because you are immortal, whether you know it or not. Anybody that Christ raised from the dead, die not. Just as Christ rose, 2,000 years ago is still alive to today. So also you that is raised, you live forever. So, if you live forever, that means your blessing will live forever. And your torment will also live forever. So, brethren, knowing this truth is not to threaten you. 
I want you to understand the truth so that you understand the scenario of God's judgment when he returns. He is returning because he has given us every hope. Even an American singer called it extravagant grace. Grace that is greater than any sin we can ever commit. It doesn't matter how many people you have killed. It doesn't matter how many lives you have wasted. It doesn't matter how terrible your sin is. The Lord says, if you return to me, I will return to you. I will be a father to you. You will be my son. Even if you have killed everybody in my house. Even if you have done wicked things that Matt cannot testify about. The Lord said, if you return with all your heart. He said, I will return to you. This is the grace that is unimaginable, unfathomable. This grace is abundant now. We don't know when it will expire. The moment the trumpet sound, the grace is over. Now all that is left is the fiery loose of the judgment. And the terrifying fire that will consume the anniversary of the Lord. Bedlam. Now is the day to give that grace a second thought. To consider your life and repent of your wicked ways. The first coming or call when human being lives a perfect life and dies. Christ lived a perfect life and he died on the cross for no sin of his. Even the Roman apostolates could not find him guilty of any sin. He knew the people gave him all for envy. They choose a criminal instead of him. Now he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. All religion believe that Christ is the Son of God. Many only believe and they doubted the resurrection and they have various conjunctions trying to fight the resurrection because they could not just stand the fact that he rose from the dead. Because the only defeat of the devil is Christ risen from the dead. That means death has no power over him. And he was bold enough to say to death, Here is your sting. And to grave, Here is your victory. Because the sting of sin is death. And the sting of death is the law. Now that Christ has swallowed it up in victory, He has given you the same grace to rise above the power of death. The Bible said, I will tell you not to fear the one that can kill the flesh. And after that, His authority ends. There is no much more he can do. After killing you, that is where the power of the devil comes to an end. He can't do anything more than that. But I will tell you the man you should fear. The man after he has killed the body, he is able to cast the soul into hell. That is the person you should fear from today on. Brethren, don't be afraid of a man that will tell you, I will kill you. He can do nothing after that. The greatest threat you can receive on earth is the ability to kill you. Beyond that, his authority ends, his power ends, his wisdom ends, his knowledge ends. Every other thing he cannot do. Ask him after death what next? He cannot answer because he doesn't have it. He doesn't know what he can do after that. But I tell you who you should fear. Fear God. Who after he has killed the body, he is able to consume with eternal punishment in hell. That is the God you should fear. The God who after he has killed the body, he is able to cast it to Guyana. Everlasting torment. He is able to destroy both the souls and the flesh. That is the God you should fear. Don't fear the man who can kill the flesh. And after that, his authority comes to an end. God is warning you today. Tomorrow might be too late. And it makes us clear in verse 7 that Christ's millennial reign on earth is not the time of judgment. The millennial reign is for a period of a thousand years. God gave the inhabitants of the earth after the end of the world, the Antichrist reign, the disasters of all the climates, two thousand years of a thousand years of peace both 
for the returning saint from heaven and the saints that remains on earth. Or the people, the earth dwellers who did not go to heaven in the first place. He gave them a thousand years of peace to see if they would make their way. <coughs> if they would humble themselves under the mighty arms of the Lord. But man, when the devil rose up after a thousand years, he still gathered them at the sand of the shishon. That What does that tell you about man? It is not by fault of any man we fell. We fell by our own fault. Man is a falling, falling creature. And when he gathered them, God destroyed them. That was when the judgment was finally set. But before the judgment is set, you will see something amazing. There is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The earth, the environmentalists are trying so hard to protect, we still pass away. That doesn't mean you should not replenish the earth. That doesn't mean you should not beautify it, you should not protect it from hardship or environmental condition. But the earth, while you are giving your life to it, remember two things. The earth is decayed and it's rotting and it will pass away. There will be a new one, a brand new earth and a brand new universe or space, whatever you call it. There will be a new one. This old one is decay. It's stained with sin. It's stained with abomination. God is going to make it pass away. Do you want to pass away with it? Or you rather brace to the man that knows tomorrow. That is Jesus. That is the ultimate power. Every other power in the universe will fail. The Bible says the king of the earth, they hide themselves in rock and cave. Because of him that sat upon the throne. It, at this the authority you want to put your hope on. Some people will tell you I have connection. What connection can be greater than that of Christ? What connection? Do you want earthly connection that will fade away with the world? Who is man that dies that you should put your trust under his feather? Are you going to put your trust under the power of the bamboo? Fire will come out from the bamboo tree and divert both you and the bamboo tree. Are you putting your trust under the authority of man? The fire will consume you and the man. The authority should be under God, not under any man. Man cannot keep himself alive from death. There is no man that liveth. He cannot even give a ransom for his own life. Are these the people you want to put your trust upon? The Bible says, if any man shall come to the Lord, he must first of all deny himself. Carry his cross and follow him. The judgment of God is so gruesome. The Bible says, in verse 15, let's read from verse 13. He said, I will start from verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and the brimstones. And the beast and the false prophet, we are the year, earlier cast. Remember last week we talked about the first thousand years before the millennium. We had the beast and the antichrist were taken and thrown into the lake of fire. And the devil was sealed up in the bottomless pit with a mark that he should not deceive the nation anymore. But now he is taken out of that bottomless pit and is thrown into the fire. We are the Antichrist and the beasts we are earlier through. There is a lake of fire. I don't know the name you call it. Some call it hell. They call it different name, but there is a lake of fire. And this lake burns only with fire and magma. If we believe there is a volcanic ash and volcanic deposit underneath the earth, we should also understand there is a lake that burns with only fires and brimstone. Then, they were thrown into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet were. <laughs> and what happened after that? Remember the end of 1,000 years had just passed. That means the end of the world, when the Bible tells you the end of the world is not what, this is what it means. It's not going to happen instantaneously where everybody dies. No. After the, the great tribulation, there is still 1,000 years of the earth. This earth 
not the new one. It is after that 1,000 years that the new heaven and the new earth will be born. When the old earth will pass away and the new earth will emerge and the new heaven will emerge. And the Bible makes us understand that I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. That was when God would wake up from his sleep. <laughs> Ready to judge all human beings, whether great or small. It doesn't matter your size, your, your, your title, your degree, your level in life, your accomplishment. You will stand before God. And a book was open, and another book was open. <laughs> Two books. One is a book that keeps record of every human being that ever lived upon the earth. Every human being has a record. Strange enough. Are you looking for family tree? This is the original family tree. It's here within the hand of, the God, of God himself. Because he created us, he gives record of every child that has ever passed through the womb. Every sperm that exists in a man's body, they are accounted for here in this book. So if you take a life, that life will also be accounted for in this book. So this life are created. They are bought for a price. No wonder Jesus said to us, we should not swear by anything. That we cannot make one hair white or black. Because every life on earth is accounted for in this book. The first book. There is no man living or dead that his name is not in the first book. It doesn't matter whether you are righteous or wicked. Your name is in the first book. That's why I told you two books were open. One is the book of life. All living has their name in it. The second one is the book of deed. Where every deed you do are written there. <laughs> so, brethren, and the Bible says a book was open and another book was open which is the book of life. The book of all living. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the book. John did not know what was written in the book. God did not show him that in the revelation. But things about you, personal secret, things you think no eye see, that you did under the cover of darkness, you did in the secret place of the earth, that hidden things nobody knows except you, they are written in that book. <laughs> you cannot hide yourself. The Bible said you cannot hide it from God. Though you may cover your sin that no man may see, you cannot just hide it from him. His eyes see all. If a prophet of God could tell what the king does in the sacred chamber, I believe you, God eyes sees what he does in the underground your house, in the basement of your house. In the dead of the night when no eyes can see you. These things are not written to make you afraid. They are written so that you might learn the truth and turn from the wicked ways. This book was open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in this book, according to what their work. Their work, the book of deeds, is the second book. The first one is the book that keeps record of all human beings living and dead. The second one is the book of deeds. I wonder how big this book is. Every human being on earth, all their titles, their dreams, their aspirations, their wasted opportunity, their wasted talents, all are written down. The Bible says, any man that stand on this judgment were judged according to one thing, their works. And that is one thing you should run away from. I don't pray that anyone living or dead, even my enemy, to be judged according to their works. Because God judging us by our works, nobody on earth will be found innocent. Not even me. Not anybody will be found innocent. Brethren, that's why you should struggle to enter in because many will try to, but they will not be able to walk on the narrow road so that you don't need to be judged by your work. 
Because if you are judged by your work, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Nobody that is judged by his work survived the great tribulation. Do you know what it means to bring back all your past sins and lay them before your face and want you to justify them in holiness and righteousness? You are not being judged under grace here. You are being judged under the law. The law did not find anybody free. Not even Moses that the law came from. That is what we are talking about here. You will be judged by the law. And when you are judged by the law, you cannot be innocent. And brethren, if you don't want to live by Christ, you will perish under the law. So you have one choice. I said Jesus today, come under his umbrella of salvation and receive a judgment free from religion. A judgment free from the law. Or stay under the law and be judged under the law. So there are two types of judgments. Those that live by conscience will be judged under conscience. Those that live by grace will be judged under grace. But those that live by the law shall be judged under the law. These threefold judgments, they are not, they are unmistakable. And they are confirmed in the scripture. So these books is for those that will judge according to their works. And I saw the sea. What we were telling you before, the sea gave up all the dead that were in it. So the sea cannot even hold back their dead. Even all the one the demons or the marine has eaten, they vomited all of them. They bring them up. And hell deliver up all the dead. Even those that were thrown into hell, they bring up all the dead that were in them to be judged. Which were in them. And the judge of every man according to their work. Again, according to their work. This is something you have to mark in your Bible. Their work. Not according to the grace of Christ who died for them. Because this one obviously did not believe in Christ. So they were judged according to the work they did. I'm a good person. The Bible says all our righteousness has faded around before God. So if all your righteousness has faded around, how, you, how do you think you will stand the test of the judgment? All this will judge according to their works. And the dead and hell. Remember death and hell? The hate we heard about in the beginning. That many people refer to as, I die, I see myself in heaven, I see myself in hell. This is death and hell. What happened to them? They are cast into the lake of fire. So these people were formerly death and hell, which exist. This place just told you it existed. On the ground, beneath the earth. There is a place called hate. Hate. Now, in the translation of the English version, we call it hate. Hate or show, which is the place where the spirit of the dead goes. They were brought back here and they were thrown into the lake of fire. Hate and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And this is what? The second death. And those who were not found written in the book of life was also cast in the lake of fire. God bless you. This is where we are going to end the teachings for today. Next week, we are going to be looking at the new heaven and the new earth. Brethren, it's a topic you will not want to miss. Brethren, haven't heard all this word. They are heavy, I know. But the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Do you want to accept Christ today? So that you'll be counted worthy to escape all these things? Or do you want to risk it all and see with your own eyes? Because at the end, there is no denying of the truth. Do you want to witness and experience it? You have two choices. And the choices is yours to make. Your decision today will affect you tomorrow. If you decide that you want to see hate and hell, or be judged according to your works. Wait patiently. Make sure you are ready to present your good work before God and be judged according to it. If not, take the shortcut by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Repenting of all your deed and live a life worthy of examination so that when the saints are righteous to become king and priest unto the Lord, you will be among them. You will not be part of the second death. The Bible says, blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. 
If you are afraid to be killed for your faith now in this world, is it when the Antichrist will mandate death that you will no longer be afraid? That you will not stand for God? Brethren, today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. Let us pray. Father, as many that are willing to come to you, draw them to yourself. Father Lord, you send the one that comes to you, him your father honor. Lord Jesus, you gave your life. You rose again on the third day for our justification. And the Bible says, when you arise on earth, you let captivity captive in your train and you gave gift to men. Lord, let all this that we are captive to sin be taken captive by you today for your glory so that the gift of life that you have promised us might also be available to them. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, if you miss any of these parts of this video, you can still watch them by clicking live on our website at cgfnslogin.app cgs cgfnslogin.app Click the live button to take you to this page. Brethren, this is where we conclude today's teaching. And if you can still follow us on Facebook, like our page, subscribe to this video so that you can get notification every week. And you can also register with us so that you get regular meetings or read most of our book like Convert Guide to teach you on the path to salvation or go through our monthly magazine which is Mission Unveils where we unveil the latest in the church and mission works and all that God has been doing in his people's life. Brethren, or you can join our Open Hands Fellowship every Tuesday by 7 p.m. where we meet together to teach on a live program like this, you can register us through our website or through our follow up service. God bless you as you participate. Amen. And my name is Missionary Colin Sadoge. If you miss any part of this video, you can.